adaptation plan, um, which we thought was a really important thing for us to do, given that it's going to be a, a key guiding document for us in Aotearoa in terms of where we're heading, what does climate adaptation look and feel like for Aotearoa, um, what does it look like for us in terms of preparing for adaptation in the face of our changing climate, in terms of some of the urgent work that will impact us all and our communities. Um, what are the voices that are part of this adaptation uh, plan? What are the things that might be missing and what are the opportunities to move forward? So I feel really um, excited by the panel that we've got uh, today um, and I'll introduce each of them as we move through, uh, move through the webinar. A little bit of housekeeping. The awkwardness of these kinds of webinars is I actually can't see all of the people, so it feels like I'm talking to uh, talking to myself, but you can engage with me and with us and you can have a conversation with us. So there's the chat function down the bottom, which will enable you to um, have, a, have a conversation, um, but there's also the Q&A function. So we would ask that if you have any questions for our panelists um, that you would like to put to the panelists, that you put that in the Q&A a function button at the bottom and we will be able to look through those. Um, we've got our team who will help look through those um, and we can put those um, as we can uh, to our panelists if they don't already answer them as we move through, uh, through the corridor. Um, each of our panelists will have 10 minutes. The purpose of this conversation is to have a conversation. So we didn't want it to be, um, you know, this kind of formal presentation style. It is really to engage in some, some critical reflections and some um, collaborative conversation and meaning making of this thing we call the NAP. Um, and there's a whole lot of puns we could make with regards to the acronym of the NAP, but I won't, I won't go there just yet. Um, so we, uh, each of the panellists will have 10 minutes to um, have a bit of a reflection um, and then we will open it up to kind of continue that conversation through the question and answers and through a little bit more about questioning of each other um, as, as panel members. So no mai haramai, uh, ki wainga nui kia tato. it's great to have everyone here, there's a huge number of attendees which is really, it's awesome to see um, and we're really, really happy to have um, everyone in the Zoom room. So without further ado, um, what I would like to do is introduce our first uh, panellist, Grace Hall. Grace is the Director of Policy and Advocacy at Local Government New Zealand. She's held that role um, since early this year, um, but this is her second stint at LGNZ, and I'm sure she'll tell you a little bit more uh, about that. Um, she's worked and led um, Local Government New Zealand's work on climate change, as well as providing support to its young elected members network and Te Maruata, the network of Māori and local government. She works closely on reform of the resource management system, review into the future for local government and climate change initiatives. Um, and prior to moving into the local government se uh, sector and advocacy space, Grace practiced as a resource management and employment solicitor as well. So tēnei te mihi nunui kia koe, Grace, and we'll uh, hand over the time for you. Kia ora. Kia ora Naomi and kia ora koutou. It's great to be with you uh, all today. I'm really pleased to be a uh, part of this conversation and certainly pleased to be representing uh, LGNZ, which is the member body for councils across the motu. Um, special hello to all of the, the local government Fano who have joined for this session today. And look, can I start by acknowledging um, Naomi, Lisa and Huhana. It's great to be part of this panel discussion with all of you. Uh, and can I also acknowledge the great work that the Deep South National Science Challenge is doing and the close relationship that LGNZ and the local government sector have had with you uh, over a number of years now. So look, um, this conversation is a really important one for local government and what I'd begin by saying is that LGNZ is really pleased that we are close to having a plan for how communities will adapt to climate change. Uh, that's something that LGNZ has long advocated the need for, um, and we've long advocated the need for a much greater focus on adaptation in Aotearoa as well. Look, I think that's because local government um, is right bang in the middle of the firing line for climate change adaptation. Um, you know, councils every day are, are dealing with precarious coastal roads, uh, they're dealing with ratepayers demanding seawalls to protect their properties, and they're thinking about how to protect critical infrastructure from flood risk. 
But what, what we're increasingly seeing is that local government does risk being the meat in the adaptation sandwich. Um, look, I think, you know, communities expect councils to continue to provide services and infrastructure as they always have. Um, but what we're seeing is councils um, facing an, you know, an ever-changing and, and an increasingly complex operating environment, um, significant costs, and of course, those important obligations to keep communities safe. So look, it is little wonder um, that, that adaptation is such a hot topic for the sector. And there was a lot of hope uh, from councils that the NAP would help to provide a way through the challenges that we're collectively facing as Aotearoa. But from the conversations that LGNZ has been having with councils since the release of the draft NAP, um, we've been hearing some quite consistent themes. And that's that the NAP offers very little direction uh, to councils in terms of the actions that they can take to adapt infrastructure, land use and communities to the impacts of climate change. And in fact, the NAP actually makes very little reference uh, to the role that local government will play in the adaptation space. And um, we've heard that the NAP is, is quite unassertive and lacking in ambition, uh, particularly given the latest sea level rise predictions we've seen and the ongoing impacts um, that we know communities are already facing uh, from increasing extreme weather events. Um, our, our read of the NAP is that it's largely a long list of work programs that the government has underway already and a plan to make a number of more plans. Um, although what we would say is that it is helpful to see integrations across the different reform programs uh, and policy initiatives that are underway across government. But I think you know, the scale of the adaptation challenge is such that we need significantly more investment um, and some more tangible solutions. So councils, you know, in the conversations we're having, um, we are hearing that they had hoped for things like nationally consistent direction, uh, guidance on how to effectively engage in hard conversations about adaptation with communities, and importantly, um, investment to support adaptation action and some clarity about who pays. So I think, you know, yes, we agree there's a need for short term actions, but there's also some longer term action and long term investment commitment that's needed here too. But I think fundamentally the thing we're really keen to see is that the NAP better addresses uh, the role that councils can play in working with communities, iwi, hapu, businesses, NGOs, etc., cetera, uh, to plan for how uh, adaptation will happen at the local level. Because it's ultimately at that local level that adaptation is going to take place. So we're hearing really loudly from councils that they want to see a much more integrated, collaborative and intergenerational approach for our communities uh, to drive and inform adaptation action in the Arohi. And look, I mean, we, we want those solutions to be driven at the local level, but I think equally we know that the scale of the adaptation challenge means that central government is going to have to have some involvement in that local level uh, planning and decision making. Um, on, the, on the managed retreat framework, that, that's obviously part of the draft NAP, and we're pleased to see the beginnings of, of a managed retreat framework in LGNZ and the sector uh, have long said that a nationally consistent framework that uh, does allow for appropriate local flexibility is needed. But I think that, that what we're where we're at at the moment is that we think it's hard to see how that will realistically be rolled out without significantly greater investment, but I might come back to that shortly. I think the thing too with the managed retreat framework is that, you know, how that rolls out is going to be really dependent on where things land with the resource management reforms. And I think something else that, that our sector is quite concerned about um, is the significant skills shortage and capability and capacity gaps that we've got right now across local government, uh, but also nationwide. So how, how will we work uh, collectively with the government to address those, those skills shortages, which we'll need to address. 
So I, I've, I've talked a lot already um, about the importance to local government of, of partnering with, with people who know their place and that that's going to be critical to the success of, of adaptation action. And look, I've, I've heard lots of people say this NAPS, the government's plan for adaptation, and it's focused on legal frameworks and institutions. But I think the lack of reference to partnership approaches with local government, with community, with iwi Māori is really problematic. So I think the plan um, has missed a trick because successful adaptation isn't going to result from decisions that are made in Wellington alone. So we want, you know, we really want to see actually how the government will support communities to make adaptation plans and decisions. We've heard some interesting suggestions from, from some people in our sector. There's been a suggestion that um, the government could think about scaling up the Just Transitions Unit to support community conversations around adaptation and also how adaptation decisions land for different communities. And we're continuing to hear the importance of, of guidance uh, for councils about how to engage with communities in these really tough conversations. But what we're also hearing is the importance of that guidance being developed in partnership with the practitioners who are working on the ground right now uh, so that that guidance is practical and workable. And look, of course, um, one of the big issues for local government, and I'm sure it won't surprise many of you to hear me say this, is how the costs of adaptation are going to be met. Um, you know, communities aren't going to be able to afford the costs of adaptation on their own. Uh, and we really do need to have quite an urgent conversation collectively uh, between central and local government communities, insurers and banks uh, about how we're going to pay for adaptation and how we spread the costs equitably. I mean, certainly there are, there are vulnerable communities across the country who really aren't going to be able to cover these costs on their own. I think that also um, requires some clarity on when central government will intervene in managed retreat processes, uh, and that's including with, with funding support. I think, you know, in, in summary, um, taking a planned approach to how we fund the costs of adaptation, I think will ultimately be less costly and painful than responding through reactionary measures only. Um, and certainly, you know, our sector's been suggesting for example, that government co-investment and flood protection schemes would help reduce risks to more tol tolerable levels uh, while being much less costly than managing uh, the risks through reactionary uh, post-event post measures, you know, as we're seeing repeatedly in places like the West Coast and Tairaa Fiti. So I think, you know, our view is that now is time for a step change. It's time uh, for a New Zealand approach. The gravity of the adaptation challenge requires that. We need to move uh, beyond a business as usual approach and really try and catalyze investment and in resilience now. Um, and that's including by local government and its communities. So um, all of this being the case, you know, we're keen for a much more ambitious conversation with central government around how local government communities, iwi Māori, um, can can support can support New Zealand to make the change uh, that that is urgently needed, and so that our communities have much more certainty uh, about how we're going to deal with these these significant challenges. So that's I think that's enough from me for now. But really looking forward to uh, to engaging in the in the court all. And pleased to see that I've hit my ten minutes of timing perfectly. So uh, namahi nui. Thank you. Absolutely perfect timing, um, Grace. That's uh, fantastic. And not only perfect timing, but um, kwa whāriki hia koe i ngā, um, i ngā wero i wang, uh, i mui atato. So you've laid a really um, beautiful whāriki of some of the challenges uh, that are presented in the National Adaptation Plan for us to, to build on and a, a really wonderful kind of critical reflection around um, not only what uh, perhaps is missing in terms of the ambition and, and transformation um, and really community focus in the net, but also what some of those opportunities might be. So he mihi nunui tēnei uh, kia koe. Uh, e Grace Motho Kōrero, and if you haven't already, um, the, the chat function is um, going off with uh, supportive comments for, for what you've been saying, so um, 
thank you very much for that. And we look forward to kind of continuing the conversation uh, afterwards. And one of the lines that, that stood out, one of the things that stood out for me um, in your corridor was around partnering with people who know their place. And perhaps that is a really nice segue for us uh, into our next uh, Kai Kōrero uh, Associate Professor Huhana Smith. Um, really just want to acknowledge um, not only uh, people who know their place, but people who are their place. So tangata whenua uh, and, and um, to introduce uh, Huhana now as our next uh, kai kōrero, uh, as mana whenua for uh, Ngāti Tū Kōrehe, Raukawa ki te tonga, uh, tēnei te mihi nunui ki a koe. So Huhana is Associate Professor um, as a Visual Artist, Curator and Principal Investigator at Massey University. She's Co-Principal Investigator for uh, research that includes Mātauranga Māori methods with sciences that looks at actively and proactively addressing climate change uh, concerns for coastal Māori and Horo Whenua and Kāpiti. Um, nei rā te mihi nunui kia koe e te whanaunga e te tuakana, uh, kei a koe te, te rākau. Um, yeah, um, no Nati to Korea Hau, um, or it on a te Tawahi or the Kao Kaoro or Pata Tere, can we to me here to Kiakwe, Takufananga? Um, lovely to be here, everybody, and thank you, Grace. Like, whoa, well done, set the pace, um, in regards to what it means to be locally engaged, both from a a local government level, but also what it means to acknowledge the mana of tangata whenua, mana whenua, who are doing um, a lot of work in their, in their rohe. And how do we champion that? And how do we document that and have that uh, put forward as success stories in regards to people and iwi and hapu who are working hard at the moment to um, create adaptation, mitigation, risk assessments according to their knowledge of place. So thank you very much, Grace, for setting that up. Um, you were talking about a planned approach and that's some of the things that uh, we at Ngāti Tukurehe are very, uh, you know, we're very mindful of. Um, if I can just explain, I am, um, I'm actually a professor now, which is good. I'm actually a professor at Massey University, but Paitena, no, Kawawangawanga. Um, I am a professor at Massey University and I head the uh, Fitiorehua School of Art um, school and my areas are photography, toyoho kiapiti, which is a Māori visual arts and fine art. And I think what I've tried to do for the people who are tuning in is that um, use that critical and kind of creative facility amongst people who where the visual component is really important for them. So working with artists and designers and, um, and kai mahi toi, uh, Māori and Pacific peoples who are visualizing where they want to see themselves as far as um, what is best and what will benefit the iwi, the hapu and their whanau. So um, over the last, um, well, probably doing Freshwater from 2010 and then from 2015, um, our research teams, Ngāti Tukurehe research teams focusing on climate change, we've, we've been harnessing on that art and design element to help us um, accelerate the understanding of the complexities of, of climate change, but also um, to um, show others what we're actually thinking from an interrelated, interdependent, holistic Māori worldview, understanding of systems all happening at once, and really trying to get our local authorities to understand how we roll. And, and that's really, really important for everyone who's tuning into this, web, um, this webinar, is that the Rau Ora report has synthesized that importance to see things as interrelated and interdependent. And it was a joy to read the Rau Ora report in regards to so Ihirangi's Rau Ora report in regards to aligned with the NAP, but we're still doing this. And unfortunately, that we don't have time to keep missing the point. Um, the point is, is that it, it is local knowledge of place and it is Māori and Hapu who have lived intergeneration, intergeneration, uh, intergenerationally within their areas that are, uh, should be grounding and informing the NAP from the onset. So, um, I mean, I, you know, I'll be a little critical here. Um, I mean, joining some of these conversations. And the first thing I was just like, well, this ain't gonna work guys because you're framing it again from a, uh, a point 
you know, bullet point approach, or you're framing it from this section, this section, this section, this section, but not actually seeing it in its entirety. So what a lot of Māori who are in the space are doing are grounding their um, approaches in place, and often it's their own ancestral place, because that's where they can best speak from their ancestral place. But to act from its ancestral place is to know, uh, know your place, know your place within it, and then also bring in local government, central government, other supportive measures to help you activate the planning that needs to be done. So I think I think about, look, we've done a lot of work and I'm not gonna wax lyrical about like what we have done over time, but um, from our farming base, and we're in Kuku Hora Whenua, between the Oho and the Waikawa um, areas, um, four uh, Māori farming operations have been working on climate change projects since 2015. And we've got some real action going on on the ground. Because that's the other thing about the NAP, and I think um, Grace said it so beautifully, it's not action oriented enough. It's not kind of providing the implementable enough. And we don't need to keep talking about how it might look and how it might feel. We've got to act. So in looking at what we've been doing between the Oho and the Waikawa River, um, four farming entities um, working to make change. So for example, um, those changes could be um, increasing biodiversity for Inanga and working really hard on how to increase that biodiversity, not only for um, sustenance of iwi and hapu, but it's also a climate mitigator as well if we're doing all the things that need to be done to enhance um, Inanga with implementable Inanga ponding systems, which are also sediment traps. They're also flood mitigators. They do really cool things. Um, other um, entities within that farming area on the coastline between Oho and Waikawa and Kuku is Harakeke. Get that Harakeke back in the ground. This is happening um, quite concertedly within Aorohe. And while I go back to Massey, um, I'm working with creatives and the sustainable Harakeke fabric industry. So it's an action of putting Harakeke back in, which also gives some kind of economic but also socio-cultural support back to iwi and hapu as well. So harakeke, watch this space. Harakeke fabric industry will happen, finally. I've only been watching it since 2005, but it will happen. But harakeke is a flood mitigator. It is a water cleanser. It is a, it is a healer for animals. It is a healer for people. So let's get some of those, um, let's get that ancestral intelligence back in the whenua. That's um, a really key action. We've got um, Harakeke dye projects going on as well. So forestry, trees being grown in forests that are for these economic benefits for Ivory and Hapu to lead. Um, other things that are happening in this area, biochar projects, I've become an adv advocate for biochar. So busily burning prunings from our olive grove um, each year um, in order to create um, carbon to put back in Fenua. So another action that can be done, can be done on a micro site level, can be done on a macro site level. So investigating that process at the moment. So with the art and design element, working with art institutions. So we're currently working, there's a group of us to Waitahianuku, we're currently working with the Govett Brewster Art Gallery, and, and we have got a three year plan to put all these amazing ideas out in front of people that are led by Iwi and Hapu. So I'm, I, I can tell you a lot of things about this, but I've got 10 minutes and I probably down, uh, I've got a few minutes left. But I think if we talk about um, some of the things that like Horizons Regional Council are doing, we're a big rohe between Hore Whenua right up to, you know, Whanganui to uh, Arangatike. And, and in that, we've got a joint climate action committee. Now, this action committee is shaping up an action plan, um, an implementable action plan. Um, I take cognizance of what Grace was saying about the cost of this, central government, come in, align your funds to actually start supporting the actions that need to be done on the ground. So this cl uh, Joint Climate Action Committee is really working hard. Uh, we've got a strong bunch of Māori from across the Rohe who are working closely with councillors and also all the mayors of the district councils to really come up with a plan that is all about 
um, adding um, the most value of working when we work centrally with the Taiyao. So the Taiyao is the centre of what we're doing for this um, action plan. We're working to empower communities. We're only going to support good decisions. And I just want to say that again, local councils stop doing bad decisions. And okay, I'm going to give it, I'm going to say it, no golf links on coastal areas. One of absolute cultural significance to Iwi and Hapu, but we don't need coastal golf links when we've got climate change actions that need to be put in place. Now, this is a private entity. However, it's just not what you need at the moment. All right, I said it. Um, you can find out more about that if you want to kind of um, get in contact with me uh, personally. But it's all about so, um, supporting good decisions. Local councils should only be making good decisions now, sensible good decisions around climate change, and we must address our known issues. The other thing that I think I just want to quickly kind of um, finish on is for the Horizons Regional Council project, integrate climate change into your decision making at all time. Um, integrate climate change action into your operational programs. Give effect to the NAP once it's been modified. Um, give effect to the emissions re um, reduction program and acknowledge row order. Have row order as, a, as, as really get that interwoven into this plan and actually understood by the people, the policymakers who are putting the NAP together. They need to understand that, otherwise move Māori into those positions to say, here's what needs to be really in the NAP. Um, so that's, that's something that we need to do. Local ch climate change action planning. Um, this is something that the committee is working on. Work closely with Tangata Whenua, and that's also been highlighted in the Rauora Indigenous Framework. Um, pull the issues together and activate them from strong relationships that progress action. Adapt plans as new information emerges. The other thing about this is share your successes. There's so much work going on across the Horizons Regional Council area that are led by Iwi and Hapu. And I think about Tahani Investments and what they're doing with their farming, um, you know, carbon farming, but not just that, they're also reducing, they're going to dry stock, no more dairying, um, they're limiting, no more synthetic fertilizers. They're going hard out on all the things that express mana, mana atua, mana whenua, mana tangata, uh, and, um, and all those aspects that need to be enhanced. Um, so share those successes. As, as I said, there's lots of stuff going on around um, the Horizons Rohe. So we're doing that. That's going to come out in the report. Um, it's going to be done by July. Um, but, and then it's all preceding the election. So many of these councillors and mayors need to make sure that their climate change action is really, really embedded in their um, campaigns. Um, so support grassroots initiatives, facilitate action to, act, to actionable information, rewild our, our rohe, put green corridors as a priority across all regions. Um, and I'm getting the, the hand up. Uh, I just, I'll finish off some, on one thing. Um, there is another research project coming up with the Deep South National Science Challenge. I acknowledge them, living with uncertainty, Four case studies, so Tangi Moana, Putiki, Waitotara and, Waita, and Waitara, um, working together, being very proactive on action planning that is real and implementable. That's all I need to say. Thank you so much. Namiyatu. Oh, tēnā koe te tuakana, Ai, nei rā te mihinu nui kia koe uh, ki te whānau hoki ki ngā titu korehe mō koutou uh, mahi kaitia ki tanga, mō koutou mahi rangatira tanga, um, mō koutou mahi hei tia ki te tai au. Uh, nei rā te mihinu nui kia koe ki te whakawhiti o whakaaro uh, ki wainga nui a tātou i tēnei uh, ahi ahi. So thank you, thank you Huhana. There was some amazing um, kōrero that came through um, in there, um, you know, particularly around we don't have the time to keep missing the point. I think this is a really key, um, really key message that we've been hearing a lot of, um, that, you know, a lot of the science is telling us as well that these are urgent conversations. Um, Grace, you talked about the hard conversations that we need to be having and, and we don't have the time to keep kind of putting those off. Or, or putting them to the next generation. So I just want to acknowledge that. And also the ancestral intelligence that you talked about, the memory that our lands and waters hold and our ability to return to 
uh, return to those ways of, of remembering and, and the kinds of um, intelligence that grows from the whenua itself and, and what that means for our community. So um, I think those are really, really important conversations to think through with regards to the National Adaptation Plan and particularly with regards to how the Rawora framework sits in conversation uh, with the National Adaptation Plan as well. I see there's quite a few questions coming through. So just again, as a bit of a housekeeping note, we will come to those questions if we don't through through the panelist discussion, we will circle back to those. So please don't think we're ignoring them. We've seen them and, and we'll um, kind of pull them through into our next conversation. I made a bit of a faux pas at the beginning. I didn't actually talk about that the National Adaptation Plan is open for consultation. Um, presently, we are in the consultation phase for the National Adaptation Plan and that submissions are closed on the 3rd of June. Um, and please, team, correct me if I am incorrect, but I think it's the 3rd of June. So a very short period of time. And this perhaps is a nice segue um, to our next speaker, um, uh, Professor Lisa Ellis, but before I introduce you, um, Professor Ellis, can I just um, e te ahorangi uh, Huhana Smith, um, nō kutehi um, ki te uh, mihi kia koe te Associate Professor, nō reira he mihi nunui tēnei kia koe e te ahorangi, um, an important thing for us in te ao Māori to celebrate our Māori professors and our female professors and our Māori women professors, so just want to make that point um, I, before I hand over to another amazing Professor um, Lisa Ellis. So our next speaker um, is Professor Lisa Ellis, she's with the Philosophy uh, Professor of Philosophy and Director of the Philosophy, Politics and Economics Program at the University of Otago. Her work investigates uh, policy, how we can make policy decisions that serve our interests um, in flourishing now. I love that, in flourishing now and into the future. Um, her current project, The Collective Implications of Discrete Decisions, includes papers in environmental democracy, the collective ethics of flying, the value of biodiversity losses, climate adaptation, justice, and species extinction, which is just such a very interesting and exciting um, collection of, of mahi. She's also worked as a professional bird watcher. I know Nadine, who's in our team, is very excited by that as well um, and divides her spare time between looking for birds around the South Island, te, te waka Maui, te Waipaunamu, and working with others for transformational environmental change. So, Neira te mihi nui, kia koe te ahorangi, uh, Lisa, kia koe te wā. Over to you. Kia ora, Naomi. Um, kia ora, Huhana, and kia ora, Grace. It's such an honor to be on this panel. Um, uh, so many interesting things, so many true things have already been said. Uh, like Naomi, I just have to repeat, uh, we don't have time to keep missing the point. But beautiful. Also, we need to pay attention to people who know their place. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. So I just want to begin by um, mentioning that I'm a member of Hekopapa Honanga, which is Otago's climate change research network. And uh, I've also uh, had the good fortune to work with the Deep South Challenge on climate adaptation justice. And um, Zoe has kindly put up uh, links in the chat to those things and also to other things that I will mention um, over the next 10 minutes. Um, so if we've, as we've heard, these drafts are part of a suite of efforts to put Aotearoa on the path to flourishing together sustainably. And we all know if we had taken action, appropriate action 30 years ago, there would be a lot less to adapt to. Um, but think about what we're hearing now. Um, we heard just this morning um, that salmon farms in the Marlborough Sounds are closing because summer water temperatures are too high. And they've been dumping thousands of tons of dead bodies in the landfill, thanks to climate change. Um, a few weeks ago, we had the first reported mass bleaching of sea sponges in Doubtful Sound, so it's not just the Great Barrier Reef anymore. But between peat fires in Southland, drought in Fjordland, uh, this year I went swimming in Lake Mackenzie and there was not a single sandfly. Um, so weird, right? Um, Drought in Fjordland, flooding in Westland and Northland and pretty much everywhere else. The effects of climate change are apparent everywhere in Aotearoa. So climate action, of course, means mitigating our emissions, but also adapting to this new world. We need to change the way we live from unsustainable and unhealthy and unjust to sustainable and helpful and fair collective flourishing. 
and as inadequate as it is, and um, uh, the three of us really agree. <laughs> I've cut the bits that you already said, uh, Grace and Hannah. Um, uh, the nap is part, at least a first step in that transformation. Um, so I wanna say right away, we shouldn't underestimate the scale of the transformation. Think about, for example, the transformation from the fossil fuel energy regime, right? Um, we started out with body energy, mostly just human, had a bit of biomass, maybe a bit of animal power. Um, moving to fossil fuel energy meant you know, 30 million years of living and dying on the part of, of life compacted into a tiny piece of black rock that we could have all the energy all at once and just spend it. You, no wonder uh, it has been such an astonishingly powerful transformation of the way we live and no wonder the externalities are so damaging and um, uh, giving us such terrible problems. The very land that we're standing on is shifting beneath our feet. Um, but despite our, we, our need to acknowledge the scale of the transformation, uh, we really should not be daunted. Um, so uh, people with my kind of training spent a lot of time thinking back on um, previous uh, socioeconomic transformations. And if you look at the history of them, they always are combinations of um, local agency, ground up civic engagement um, and central leadership, um, central coordination. So this balance between local agency and central coordination is a, a permanent feature of the kinds of transformations that we have to accomplish. Um, they always start small. It's always a thin end of the wedge. People frequently embark upon these societal transformations without realizing what they're getting into. Um, but you can't get anywhere without the first steps. And the nap is um, an admittedly faulty, but nevertheless, um, first step in that direction, along with um, other things that we've recently embarked upon from the Zero Carbon Act to the um, recent budget and the emission reduction plan and everything else that we've um, been disappointed with lately. Um, so as Naomi said, we have eight days to submit on the NAP. And um, please do this, whatever your personal perspective, if you look at the questions um, that the ministry is asking, these are not um, questions that you need technical expertise to answer. If you have it, it's wonderful to contribute, uh, but it's not necessary. Uh, they're really interested in hearing about people's um, personal ethical and practical intuitions, as well as people's expert judgment about how to make this nap better. Um, so do um, follow the, the links and um, answer as many questions as you like. Uh, my former student and current Vic PhD student, Will Dreyer, has a beautiful piece on six pages only on how to write a submission. In this great book that recently came out, the link is in the chat. Um, thank you, Maria and Julie, for doing the work on that book. Will um, takes us through what it takes to make a successful submission. And it's really, um, if you've been worried about the level of difficulty, if you've seen the sorts of professional submissions that some NGOs put together, it's absolutely not necessary. And uh, responding to Tom, you don't have to let them frame your responses. <laughs> yeah, some of their questions are terrible. They're also self-serving, um, but they have to read what you submit. So frame it as, as you find useful. So what are some of the things we could say? Well, you've already heard um, some really good things. I think so far um, we can say uh, that a plan to plan, a list of programs underway, thank you, Grace. Um, it's a good start, um, but it's not what we need. Um, fundamentally, what we need in Aotearoa is to collectively determine what we owe each other. Under these new conditions, we have to make hard trade-offs. I'll be talking about that over the next few minutes. Um, so the answers to the question of what do we owe each other under different circumstances absolutely must be things that we explicitly address and don't just pretend can be decided on an ad hoc basis. If you throw, for example, taking a completely random example, 17 unordered priorities into your exposure draft, and hope that people just sort of work their way through it. That's not the same as making the hard trade-offs about what we owe each other. Um, so let me talk a little about what we owe each other. Um, we live under something that um, people like me sometimes call the social contract. 
And all that means is that um, we need a way to regulate our interactions with each other so that we're not wronging everybody every time we step out the front door. It was easier, or it is sometimes easier when you live in small groups where everybody knows each other and you can have moments of accountability provided by your grandma or your auntie. Um, but unfortunately, even people who are lucky enough to live in groups like that are still part of this vast anonymous trading society that we call global capitalism. And in vast anonymous trading societies, we need different systems to regulate our relations to each other, to answer that fundamental question, what do we owe each other, right? Your grandma will tell you what you owe her, but she's not always there when you buy a product that's not, you know, fabric from Harakeke, but in fact, fabric from an unsustainable cotton mill run by child labor. So what do we do to regulate those interactions? Um, we use systems of law and money. And of course they're inadequate, um, but those are the systems that we have to regulate our interactions. And when those systems fall short, they put us in ethical and practical conundra where we cannot arrange our relations to each other as much as we want to relate ethically to each other, we can't do it because our systems of money and law are not properly organized. Um, so uh, with regard to the NAP, for example, um, we're unable to say why somebody shouldn't be putting large amounts of new social resources in an at-risk place on the coast, the person will say back, well, it's legal and prices are steady. They were rising until a few weeks ago. Why taking the signals from the systems of law and money should I not pile scarce societal resources at the most at-risk place? Or um, for example, what do we owe the Karatani family? Um, who got permission to build at an at-risk place, um, a place at risk to coastal flooding, um, on the condition that they keep a boat on the property. Um, what do we owe them? What do we owe the communities who are struggling to keep up with increasing frequency and extremity of inundation and other weather events, as the, those who can leave and those who cannot fight to maintain their community? Um, so we need to think through those questions and our systems of law and money are supposed to allow us to do that. We need rules and government is supposed to be setting the terms under which we can collaborate on those rules and also setting hard limits, making these tough trade-offs so that we know how we can deal with each other rightly. So far, what we have with this NAP draft, we have a sort of promissory note. Um, we don't have any substantial decisions made, and we don't have substantial decisions made about how we're going to make the substantial decisions. So, for example, do we spend money on seawalls, as Grace mentioned, that allow present day property holders to continue to exist on at risk property, even as the beach amenity that they move there to enjoy erodes behind those walls? Do we allow insurance retreat in the rising tide to hollow out our communities? Do we collect money from nearly everyone to cover those most in danger, even when they should have foreseen the danger that their um, property purchasing behavior uh, uh, exposed them to? Or do we instead insist that everybody just make their own determinations and let the chips fall where they may? And doesn't that ring in our ears as something that violates the, our normal answer to what do we owe each other? And finally, how should we make these kinds of decisions? How should we engage communities in active decision-making so that we can exercise agency together without excluding the people who are usually excluded from those decisions, like rangatahi, like renters, um, like other people who are um, laboring under uh, too much work and too few resources. Um, so um, as the uh, Huhana and Grace have already signaled, um, we have precious few answers in the NAP as it exists, but we have the opportunity to provide them. Um, through the submission process. Um, on managed retreat, they do, there's some beautiful language in there, right? They recognize the main issues. We need certainty, we need risk reduction, we need solidarity, but there are no suggestions on how to deal with these tough trade-offs. They say things like we need to arrange for property transfer. What on earth does that mean? Um, why is the ministry still asking us if it's okay for people voluntarily to withdraw from the coverage of things like protection from natural hazard, that the local councils under common law, an extremely solid 
tradition of common law, local councils are responsible and will eventually be liable um, for providing these sorts of security. And the idea that we can just end that social contract by voluntarily making an agreement um, that binds everybody who buys our property now and in the future, I don't think people understand just how utterly radical that suggestion is, but they're asking us and we should tell them what we think. On flood insurance, um, the only, so, oh, it's just gone 10 minutes, goodness, okay. Um, I will uh, sum up quickly. One of the most solid suggestions in this NAP is that we ought to look at um, providing uh, socially arranged supplementary flood insurance. I would remind you that this is the model that is presently used in the United States and what it's done is prevent adaptation and transfer risk um, from uh, the least advantage to the most advantage by allowing taxpayer money to fund a rebuilding of third houses on Dauphin Island. Probably not what we want. Um, on engagement, uh, there's no discussion of the good things that are happening locally. For example, I live in Dunedin. Um, we have Dream South D. We have the St. Clair to St. Kilda engagement project. We need to be doing more of those things. And we also, um, I'm really happy to see we have Connor here. We need treaty-led climate assemblies, because we know from the international evidence that climate assemblies can wrestle with those hard trade-offs that government finds so difficult. I don't have time to go through them all now. I'm happy to talk about it in Q&A if you want, but the last um, reference I gave you was the Deep South impact and implication uh, links. Uh, the Deep South commissioned research on almost all of the things I've talked about. And there are really good answers in those research projects. Um, I, like I say, I don't have time to list them, but I think if you follow that link and take a look, you'll see um, that we've been working in this space for a while and that it's not rocket science and that there are good answers, um, a source for us again, to say back through the submission process, um, what we want to see um, from an improved NAP and an improved managed retreat plan. Um, so thanks for your patience, Naim uh, Mihinu. Tēnā koe, Lisa. I, nei rā te mihi nunu ki a koe. Um, really, um, really exciting to hear your kōrero, um, and particularly around thinking about how we all can contribute, what that might look like, um, that we can shape the conversation. We don't have to be in uh, only in response or in reaction to what is uh, what is in the nap and what the questions are that are there, um, but also thinking about that questioner and what do we owe each other. Um, and perhaps I can um, be bold and expand that and thinking about this whare that I'm sitting in, what do we owe to our mokopuna? What do we owe to the generations ahead of us? And what do we owe to the generations that have uh, been doing all of that work for a really long time? So I really appreciate you posing that question to us. I think it's a, it's a critical question question for each of us as, as individuals to consider, but also for us as organisations and institutions and, and researchers and practitioners and all of the things uh, that we are. So I think it's a, a really great way for us perhaps to move into the next phase of our um, of our panel, which is the opportunity for us to um, engage a little bit more with some of the questions that are coming through um, and some of the things that have come up from each of the, the panel discussions. It's been a really great um, uh, three presentations and I um, want to thank you all for keeping so uh, strictly to time it's wonderful that doesn't usually happen on these kinds of things particularly when it's it's more um, kind of free-flowing corridor so I, I really appreciate it and now I'm I'm trying to make myself keep to time and keep to schedule so on that note what I uh, what we'll do now is we'll uh, start to look at some of the um, questions that have been coming through um, you would have seen hopefully some of those popping up um, and and perhaps had a chance to, to think through some of those. Um, and I see that you've already, um, is the very efficient wahine that you are, um, have answered some of them already <laughs> in the chat function. So that's that's really great. One of the things that kind of came through in a couple of the questions, and it, and it seems to be there in, in um, some specific detail by Emma, but in uh, Huhana, you touched on it as well, is the decision-making that is occurring um, outside of the NAP 
the decision making that is occurring in local councils uh, in government reforms what are those decisions um, both the legacy decisions I think and the more contemporary decisions that we're starting to see in the shifts in uh, the RMA the three waters uh, some of the biodiversity stuff we know that there's work that's going to be happening in the conservation and heritage space as well um, you know how and one of the one of the things we've been reflecting on is how do those uh, various changes, those decisions that are being made or have been made, how do they, how are they reflected or speak to this national adaptation plan? What is the correlation between all of these shifts and changes? And Emma's, um, so that's kind of a, a big, high, high level, big picture thing, but Emma's uh, question, which looks more specifically at um, how do we consider climate change and biodiversity um, when we're looking in some areas of blanket increases in housing density rules. So that's kind of more of a specific example of perhaps what I'm, um, what I was trying to get to. Um, so she's she's uh, asked the question around how you reconcile the statements in the NAP, particularly in relation to climate change and biodiversity and urban or suburban planning with those recent changes to housing density rules. And then the second part of that question is, do you expect councils will have the opportunity to exhibit greater autonomy uh, on this? So um, perhaps I can uh, pass to Grace first. Um, Grace, if you'd like to maybe have a reflect on that and then if the other panelists would like to uh, contribute and then we'll carry on. Thank you. Um, look, I've got I've got lots of reflections on on this question and and kind of all of the questions that I guess stem from it. I think it is a it's a challenge that we're hearing councils talk about a lot, and I think it comes back to the point that you made in your quarter, Lisa, that actually we haven't, as a country, made difficult decisions about how we manage trade-offs. Um, and I saw the, the comment that my old mate James Hughes has made in the, in the Q&A as well around, you know, we have this situation where um, urban intensification is, you know, often billed as something that's really good from an emissions reduction point of view, high density living, connection to public transport, et cetera. Um, but then obviously, yeah, it's it's problematic too in terms of how we address the adaptation issue. I mean, I'm hopeful that the reform of the resource management system and in particular the proposals around spatial and strategic planning might help us to address some of this stuff. But I think fundamentally when, as Lisa said, we've still got a list of 17 unprioritized outcomes in the natural and built environment, um, you know, that, that seems like that's going to be an ongoing challenge. I mean, what, what I would say too is I think we as LGNZ know that there, there is a lot of, there's a lot that councils could be doing better um, in this space and certainly we're, you know, we're, we're thinking quite actively about how, how we can support councils. We're thinking about how we can support a particularly the politicians who are making some of these these really tricky decisions I mean there's there's lots of awareness building that that needs to happen there's lots of education that needs to happen and I'm particularly conscious that that's even more acute now given you know local government elections in October and the likelihood of of a large number of new elected members so so there's certainly work that that LGMZ needs to do with with central government with councils I think um it's actually helpful for the, the political decision makers and councils to start hearing some of what we've been talking about today from communities as well. You know, the, the community kind of pressure and, and expectations around this sort of stuff is the kind of messaging that we need the people who are making decisions about the future of our communities. We need them to be hearing that. So, I mean, those are sort of some all, of, all over the show thoughts but I think you know ultimately we do need the government to actually you know make some rules and make some decisions around tough trade-offs because I think without that um, we're going to continue to be in a situation where yeah, pressure does go on for houses or golf courses to go in places that they shouldn't be going. 
Elder Grace, a uh, mahi nui tēnei kia koe. Um, maybe I can just spin off that off that question, particularly around some of those hard conversations, those difficult conversations where there may be uh, competing interests. And Huhan, I just wanted to maybe draw you in there because sometimes what we've seen is that some of those difficult conversations or blanket rules that might be might be seen as in the best interest of all actually become uh, not in the best interest or create additional inequities for Māori communities or Māori land or our ability to engage with Māori land um, and perhaps even to the to the extent of creating treaty breaches and so I'm wondering if we're thinking about the climate change space um, and in, in your very localised community context um, what are your whakaro around um, particularly the NAP, but also some of the work that's happening um, in relation to thinking about a, an equitable and a te tiriti transition uh, in terms of some of the, the, the hard decisions that we know have to be made um, for climate change, but what that might mean for, for your community um, at Ngāti Tūkorehe. Mm, well, um, I mean, it's interesting. It's kind of a, it's a bit of a, um, a kind of cross-political world going on at the moment. Um, uh, we, as an iwi, we've been very proactive to have strong relationships with local and regional councils for many years. So um, let's say last 25 years, we've been working hard on having really strong relationships and building up memorandums of partnership and, um, and look at what we're all doing here, you know, leading from an ancestral intelligence point of view, um, all these projects we've done, you know, regional council can then comes in to help. Local council is aware of what's happening. And then you get a change of local government and all that kind of information kind of goes sideways, like, um, yeah, goes sideways. And I say that because um, in my experience at the moment is that a lot of the work that we've done is actually becomes unknown to a new complement coming in, which is really, really, really unfortunate because there's an incredible amount of work that's been done to build relationships. And then it's like an amnesia has kind of washed over and everyone forgets. And... I think um, in the decision-making side of things too, there seems to be a, um, a, a misjudgment. Um, despite councils, local councils should know far more about climate change impacts in their world. There is a lens that's turning one particular way and just driving forward to try and get that last edge of development happening somewhere or that last, you know, we've got to forge that decision because 50% of the councils may not be au okay with climate change and 50% are. It's not good enough. That's, it, it's essentially, it's extremely poor. Like I've been quite gobsmacked. Um, uh, I, I went to Massey for six, I've been in Massey for six years and I'm a little gobsmacked when I come back to do some stuff on the ground, um, particularly around what I believe is a really terrible, <laughs> inappropriate development within a climate change uh, where we need to be accelerating action around climate change um, because the mindset has, has blinkered towards, uh, you know, well, blinkered towards finances or someone with money holding the power. So that's been a really, really um, bad situation that's happening for us at the moment, which seems to belie all the good work we've done around water health, enhancing water health, um, creating projects that are of, community benefit like led by iwi and hapu but of community benefit and we feel a bit gobsmacked that the decision making is kind of defaulting back to a business as usual um, perspective so i think um, that that happens a lot around the country and it's really um it's it's disturbing but anyway so yeah i've been disturbed for the last five months trying to kind of fight this kind of inappropriate coastal um development that is um, a proposal at the moment it's not an actuality so i think if anyone who knows in this, um, the group of people out there who are looking at this webinar, I think you might know, but if anyone wants to contact me personally about it, I can tell you more information. Um, so yeah, decision making, is it should be based on the best um, research put forward. So the NAP is trying to encapsulate the complexity of what we're dealing with. But I just go back to that point um, that the Indigenous worldview, even though um, the NAP, the Ministry for Information, um, Ministry for Information, Ministry for the Environment, um, called upon Māori experts to help drive, so Ihirangi help drive an Indigenous-led approach to climate change and, and, and bring that forward. Uh, 
it's like with any kind of process that's not well planned that that kind of thing should be right at the onset so that your 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 knowledge systems are working closely to with each other to generate a plan that is actually useful from a grounded Māori perspective. So when you have a strong grounded Māori perspective at the beginning of the development of what is considered the most important planning um, contemporaneously, if you only apply like a smaller circle to the bigger circle, like the NAP's a bigger circle and the Ihirang is a smaller circle, we're going to get that missing. And I just think um, uh, what we should be doing now for the MAP, NAP um, in the consultation process is really elevating it our order again and saying where it where it where it interfaces and where it integrates and where it is um, shows interdependencies and interrelationships. Let's get that happening as far as part of our um, consultative process. Um, yeah, sorry. Long, if I could just put it no, on. no, it's great. And I would really encourage those of you that um, if you haven't looked at that order framework, I think it's a really important. Uh, a document to look at. It's a really important. It tells a it tells a much different story to what the national adaptation plan uh, mm. tells, and it has a, a much different and I would suggest much more ambitious approach in terms of what it's and much more grounded approach in terms of what it's looking at. Um, Huhana, if I can just yep, sorry. oh sorry, oh, just if you could just maybe make that point, and then I just there's some there's some other really good questions coming through in the in the Q and A that I'd like it's to get. It's very through. simple. The vessel, the vessel that we should from now on, the vessel that we create for any kind of major governmental local government planning, ground it in Indigenous knowledge worldview, and then bring everyone into the kete, bring everyone into the vessel, but just acknowledge that it can be brought together as long as the leadership is allowed from iwi and hapu. So they're just little, the simple little things that can happen. It saves a lot of heartache and a lot of headache later. And I think um, we, uh, Nadine and our team has done a bit of an analysis of the NAP next to the Rawara framework and a really uh, amazing kind of spreadsheet. So yeah. if there are people that are interested in, in that analysis, then I'm sure we can, um, I'm saying this and I haven't asked you, but I'm sure we we could uh, share it with <laughs> share it with you. I just want to move to some of our other partai and this um, I might turn to you, Lisa. Um, so Cherie's asked, and I'm going to read this question because I think it's really it's a really important kind of key question for us, um, not just about the net, but more generally as well. She says, not everyone at the flax roots where this is all biting has the time or resources to dedicate to participating in submission processes. And yet this is what we are being asked to do a lot at the moment. What tools, options are available for those on the ground now who are just trying to keep their heads above this flood of reform and environmental change in the absence of a final NAP or national guidance? Kia ora, that is such a good question. <laughs> so the best thing that we can all do while we're being overwhelmed by um, this uh, sort of, uh, could you please uh, do governance for free in your spare time? Uh, sometimes the flood of submissions makes you think, gosh, if all of us are so busy submitting all the time, that must mean we can't be out in the streets making trouble. <laughs> um, another important thing to consider is that if you frame your engagement process such that people have to bring private resources to bear in order to fulfill them, you naturally exclude everybody who's too busy or too broke or has too many competing uh, uh, commitments from uh, participating in the engagement and you get your classic engagement that serves the interests of the most advantaged rather than the least advantaged. Um, and uh, some councils are really aware of this and forward of this. Um, one of the coolest examples I know about is in the um, St. Clair to St. Kilda um, dis uh, waterfront decision-making process that was run uh, in Dunedin over the last couple of years. And they recognized that um, one of the people who was super important to, to talk to um, would be people with young families. And they're exactly the people who do not have the energy to show up on Friday at noon and inform the council what they should be doing. Um, so they worked together with the local artist collective and offered um, uh, an art, a coastal art project at a, a, in a primary school uh, where the artists would work with people's children to think about their vision for the coast. And while the kids were busy, the parents were able to contribute to the engagement process about how should we make these really tough decisions about managing the coast in the face of climate change. Tough decisions like, 
what should we do with the landfill that's increasingly at risk of becoming exposed? Thank you, previous generation, for leaving it there for us. Right? So those sorts of innovations are absolutely essential if we're not to overtax people with um, requests for participation. And just one more thing on that absolutely amazing topic. One of the beautiful things about the ideal of uh, treaty-led climate assemblies is that the way they're structured recognizes people's opportunity costs in terms of time and energy. Um, so there are uh, things like childcare, COHA, even straight out payment um, are absolutely on the table when people commit to you know every weekend for nine months working together to resolve some tough trade-offs. And if you look at well-resourced climate assembly results, you can see that they were able to speak across difference and get to places that nobody thought was possible, even in difficult areas like what should we do about um, a few people's really excessive uh, aviation emissions. Um, so the short answer to that is yes, it's overwhelming, uh, it's an artifact of the fact that uh, this system is extremely flat and accessible, but what that means is a lot of free effort on our part. And therefore a well-constructed decision process will recognize that people have different capacities and try to compensate that. Hi, kia ora Lisa. Um, that was a really great answer and um, some really great examples I think too that, that we can take away with us. And I. Um, I know, because um, hence why I'm sitting in this whare is that there's a whole lot of <laughs> a free um, and important work that uh, that occurs in the in the um, spaces of these walls. Both in, um, I think, kind of uh, a little bit what you were referring to, Huhana, is defending poor decision making um, and trying to protect <laughs> what remains, but then also trying to be more proactive in our planning and and think more aspirationally and more amb and ambitiously about what what is possible and, and what we can do. There's a few more questions that are sitting here in our Q&A and we did allow for a little bit of extra time um, just so that we could get through some of them um, and, and continue the discussion but there's a, a part I hear around uh, from Leslie uh, Smith which is thinking about how could the government approach the prioritization of actions with Within the national adaptation plan um, and the role of the risk assessment uh, in terms of how it feeds into this. So I might just throw that out open to, to all of you and see if any of you have any um, thoughts on that. I think the, the observation I would make is that it is interesting that the draft national adaptation plan seems to have been developed without and I mean this is possibly the argument would possibly be because it's it's a central government plan but there doesn't seem to have been a huge amount of input into the development of the draft plan by the community um you know and I think this does come to some of the points that we've just discussed around people's capacity to en engage and how much there is going on at the moment but I think you know actually engaging with the community, engaging with tangata whenua, engaging with councils, you know, that, that might have helped the government to give some prioritization to the 140 action list or whatever it is that they've that they've come out with. Um, I mean that's just that's an initial thought from me. Kiara, yeah, I agree. Um, uh, if there had been community engagement people would have thought through this from their particular interest. For example, the youth interest is practically invisible, in, at least in the, the main map. And the, the intergenerational transfer that is envisioned is, um, you know, it's hidden behind jargony phrases like, the people who benefit most from adaptation action should share the costs. So who are the people who benefit most from adaptation action? It's young people and future generations. The idea that we should transfer the cost of adaptation to the youth and future generations is for most people an absolutely monstrous moral proposition. And I think we should get it out there and ask people, does this express our obligations to each other? Does it make sense for us to cling to business as usual at the expense of our children and grandchildren? Uh, there was the, the really nice um, piece of work done um, by colleagues of mine here in co cooperation with people up north Oh, um, so sorry, I'm forgetting the name of the project, but the, the beautiful takeaway was that um, people planning are in this space need to think about being here for the next thousand years. 
And a, a glib talk of responsibility transfer, uh, it, it covers over that, that more important perspective. I'll look that up so I can put it in the chat. I think so we've talked today a bit about, you know, the need for some practical, practical, tangible stuff to come out of this nap now. In terms of a, a prioritization exercise, I mean, we know that communities like Tairafati and communities on the West Coast are being hammered by extreme weather events on a really regular basis. So, I mean, that the kind of practical part of me thinks actually could there have been some exercise that was done in, in partnership with communities, with councils to go, where are the parts of the country where we could try and do some practical stuff to start adapting now, acknowledging that, you know, the, the scale of the adaptation challenge is huge. We, we need to adapt the whole country to climate change fast and now, but realistically, you know, we, we can't do everything overnight. So maybe maybe an approach like that also might have helped to get some stuff actually happening. Hey, kia ora, kia ora kōrua. Um, that, that really segues on, I mean, this is a really key theme in what's coming through in the conversations. There's a couple of questions that I think probably are speaking to, uh, to uh, similar things, but is really thinking about how we move away from, or, or what does it mean to move away from these top-down approaches and more to our local communities and inclusive ways of decision-making? Um, and then kind of tied to that is the next question, which is around, well, what's the point of a national adaptation plan? Um, what, what does it mean to, to act locally and to actually do that work locally? So I wonder if, you, if you've just got some thoughts around, uh, around um, that question, perhaps as our, our final round of um, uh, thoughts uh, for this panel before we uh, sum up and just give a bit of an update to everyone about what's what's next on our agenda. Um, well, I'll hop in on that. Um, I, local agency needs to understand what is its fair share. Um, mm -hmm. So if you don't have central coordination, then it's not possible for local people making decisions about adaptation to know um, how much leeway is there? So a good example of that is the Hawks Bay um, collaborative decision-making process where um, they did so many things right, a, a, a long engagement attempting to be inclusive, um, uh, asking people to think through over a period of many months what the real physical consequences of their short, medium and long run decision-making would be around things like, well, do we build hard defenses or not? Um, but the problem is, when they were asked about their values, um, they said things like, look, we can't think about everything at once. So we're not gonna think about biodiversity values. We're not gonna think about our contribution to the extinction crisis. We're not gonna think about the local ecosystems. And that was their decision that they made in isolation. And of course it's not fair, right? We all have a responsibility to protect uh, uh, the things that we um, have decided collectively matter to us, for example, preventing extinctions of rare endemics that only exist in Aotearoa. Um, so there has to be both moments. There has to be a local agency deciding their future, making those hard trade-offs, but they have to have direction from the center about what are the constraints within which we make those decisions. Is there a um, maybe final thought from each of you? Um, I'll go Huhana and then Grace. Uh, oh, well, I mean, I always, it always comes down to resourcing. I think about the work that we've activated between Hortofino and Kapiti over the years, and it's always about funding applications, funding, 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 finding funding. Um, and I think over the years, we've drawn a lot of funding together to get things um, act, uh, enacted. However, it's, uh, I suppose really, really good analysis in regards to you know what Treasury can can supply to government, central government to really actually do some serious planning to how you know resources could be distributed. So get some funds distributed across the country is really important for getting action done. Um, because we can't we can't wait anymore. I'm we're 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 in downtime, we're in behind time. So um that's you know that's why I suppose our 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 teams you know Māori led teams just to keep driving forward while we wait for the rest to catch up. Uh, but I can't say it any simpler than that. Is that the resourcing 
needs to be just funneled and just start now, just get it distributed well. And I don't know, I'm not that person, I don't hold that power, but um, boy, we need it. Communities need it and they need it now. Um, I, do, I think if I just add quickly, that little disastrous event we had last uh, Friday, Levin, had a tornado, <laughs> came from the sea and cut a swathe, a zigzag swathe through Oho, Levin, golf so, golf size, um, golf ball size, golf balls again, golf ball sized um, hailstones. Um, and stopped at the Oho River. So it didn't kind of come into cuckoo dramatically, but just a massive shock event. More of those, more of those coming. So yeah, resourcing, please. Lots of it. Start sharing it across the country. Yeah. Um, Grace, do you have some, some final thoughts on those points? Yeah, look, I think, you know, the point, uh, the point of a national adaptation plan you know, I think we had, local government had hoped that touching on what Lisa and Huhana have said, that it would be that kind of point of central coordination. It would address how central government will actually support all of the different players at the local level that will be key to adapting our communities to climate change with, you know, funding, tools, resources, you know, and, and kind of providing that that plan for not just what central government will do, but how central government will support communities to do. I think that's what we would have liked to have seen. Kapai, o tēnā koutou. Um, nei rā te mihinu nui kia koutou i te toko toru nei. Uh, um, he mihinu nui tēnei kia koutou mō koutou pukinga uh, o koutou uh, whakaaro o koutou uh, kōrero uh, kei wainga nui a tātou. Uh, huri noa kia koutou, um, kua tai mai ki te whakarongo ki te uh, whakapiti pātai. So thank you everyone for um, coming. Uh, thanks very much to our, our three panellists. This has been a really amazing um, session and I think you've, each of you have brought some uh, really interesting perspectives but there's been some great kind of synergies across particularly with regards to local autonomy and agency and thinking about what that means the importance of place and our relationships to place and and also recognizing um, our kind of moral obligations to each other but also our cultural obligations to te tiriti and to our tangata whenua and, and to our whenua itself so just really want to acknowledge um, the three of you for, for building that, that conversation for us and to our attendees um, for all of your fantastic engagement in the chat and the um, Q&A. It's, it's quite a lot to kind of keep up with everything that's going on, but there's some really great stuff happening in the background uh, there as well. Just before we close off, though, just as a little bit of an update, as I said, this is the first of a, a number of webinars that we'll be hosting. Um, they will happen on the last Wednesday of every month. So this was kind of a little bit out of sync because of the, the uh, time frame for consultation with the National Adaptation Plan. Our next one is on the 29th of June, which is looking at coastal adaptation, 12 to 1.30. Again, we'll put out more information uh, about that. And then we have another one on the 27th of July, um, same time, 12 to 1.30. And that is about reading the taiao. It's about thinking about how we read and feel uh, the environment. Um, and so we'll have various um, uh, researchers, Deep South researchers, um, and other partners uh, participating in those webinars. We've also got a really special Matariki event that's happening on the 21st of June, the evening of the 21st of June, um, with one of our Tokunga Otemara Mataka, Ricky Solomon. Um, and that's at 7.30 p.m. It's kind of an hour conversation with him about the maramataka and climate change. So we're really excited about those next three and then we'll advertise the, the ones to come. So just wanted to kind of plug that to our um, all of our uh, amazing people that are here um, and share that around and we will... Um, we'll make sure we get the comms out uh, out for that as well. Just a reminder, the National Adaptation Plan is open for consultation. I'm not familiar with it, <laughs> so it's like a, you can submit by the 3rd of June, um, but really would encourage you to think about putting something in and, and thinking about the way that you can do that in a way that is that feels, uh, tika feels correct for you and, and your community and your organisation and, and to have a voice. Um, I know we've had some conversations about even people submitting poetic 
um, poetry as, as submissions. You know, there's no limitations for us to do that. And so um, maybe we can take the lead in terms of our um, transformation through what it is that we say and, and how, we, uh, how we use our voices in that regard. So just want to thank everyone um, for this amazing session. Thank you to our speakers. And we really look forward to um, seeing what kind of transpires from these, these really important, critical, hard, urgent conversations. The time is now. Um, no reira. Mahi a te mahi. I think that's our, our key message this, uh, this afternoon. So I'm just going to close us with a karakia and, and um, we can all uh, go on our way doing, doing all of the amazing work that is being done in our communities. No reira mi noe tātou. Unuhia, unuhia, unuhia ki te uru tapu nui, kia wātea, kia māma, te nākau, te tinana, te wairua ki te aratakatu, koe ara e rongo whakairi ake ki runga, kia tina, haumie, huie, tai, ki e.